Uh, now, for those of you who may not know me, my name is David. I'm the worship pastor here at 14.6. And uh, I just want to start uh, by saying a huge thank you to our senior pastor, Pat, for giving me the opportunity uh, to speak uh, the Word of God to you guys uh, this weekend. Uh, I want to start by asking you all a question uh, so with a show of hands, how many of you would consider yourselves a goal-oriented person? Anybody in here? Goal like you are driven to achieve the task that has been set before you. Not you, huh? <laughs> Anaya is not a goal-oriented person. But I could say that many, many of us in here are probably goal-oriented people. There's just something uh, fulfilling, right, about accomplishing and reaching that goal that we are striving for. It gives us that sense of accomplishment. It gives us a sense of achievement. And quite frankly, it gives us a sense of purpose to what we're doing. Uh, something to aim for, something to strive towards. Now, I remember back when I was doing the youth pastor thing a few years ago, we would always take the youth group to the Surprise Park for uh, just once a month or so, just to give them some, a chance to socialize, bring friends. And uh, every time we went, it seemed like they always wanted to play volleyball. And I don't have a problem with volleyball. I like volleyball. I would never claim to be good at it, uh, but I enjoy playing it. But in all honesty, I hated playing volleyball with this group of kids. I hated it because I honestly think there was something wrong with them, honestly, because every time we would start playing, they would play and they refused to keep score. Right? Why would you play without keeping score? It drives me nuts, right? I, I'd even be like, sometimes we need to, uh, you know, keep score so that we know who the winners and the losers are, right? I mean, that's just kind of, you know, the way it works. That's why we play a game. We play because there's a goal in mind. Winning is the goal. If you don't keep score, you don't win. What is the point? Now, I know that the reason that they wanted to do that was because they just wanted to have fun together, right? They wanted to get to know each other. And honestly, it was a great thing for the health of the youth group overall. But for me, it felt like wasted energy to play a game without a goal in mind, right? Now, if, if, if we're just here to, to get to know each other, why don't we just go sit on the bench and talk about our feelings, right? That's, that's, what, that's my style, right? But without keeping score, there's no real purpose, right? And when we don't have a purpose, we don't have a goal in mind, and we can loosely, easily lose interest, can't we? We lose focus and we lose purpose. And it's the same way with our spiritual lives, church. We need to keep our eyes on the prize. We need to keep Jesus the main thing. Because, spoil alert, in the end, Jesus is all that matters. He is all that matters. He's the goal. He is the purpose. And the passage that we're going to be looking at today uh, is written by the Apostle Paul, and he, he talks about this very idea of keeping our eyes on the prize. In fact, he compares the Christian life to that of an athlete vigorously running a race, meaning the Christian life was never meant to be easy. It was never meant to be comfortable. It was surely never meant to be mundane. But sadly, many of us have settled into this type of Christian living, haven't we? It's easy to do. And I don't know about you guys, but I'm, I'm tired of complacency. I'm, I'm tired of the status quo. I'm tired of stagnant Christianity. You know why? Because I don't see that kind of life written in these pages. I don't see that kind of life written in these pages. What I see on these pages is the life of a Christ follower who, who looks like pushing through the pain with purpose in mind. Exhaustion from pushing yourself further than your shaking legs can handle. Sweat dripping from your brow, from vigorous pursuit of reaching the finish line and receiving the prize. That's what it looks like to live for Christ. See, we are called to be all in all in, because the ones who reach the goal are the ones who are all in. So the title of my message today is, Are You In? Are you in? Turn to your neighbor and ask them, are you in? Are you in? See, right now, as we speak, 
there is a spiritual race taking place. It's happening. There is a goal to be reached. There is a race to be won. And the question is, are you in? Are you ready to do what it takes to reach the goal? Are you in? Are you willing to use every part of your being to receive the prize that is waiting at the end? Are you in? Because if you are, then it's time to are you in. We have to run, church. So lace up your running shoes, all right? Stretch out those quads and start running. Because the truth is, the moment you said yes to Jesus, you said yes to running the spiritual race. Now, whether you've made any progress in that race, that's between you and the Lord. But I can promise you this, my friends, that it is never too late to start running. So I ask you once again, are you in? Are you ready to join the Apostle Paul in running the greatest race ever to be run? Let me hear you say, I'm ready to run. run. Amen. I'm ready to run. All right. If you have your Bibles with you, you can go ahead and get those out, and we're going to go to the book of Philippians chapter 3. This is a very familiar passage, but it's so powerful. And we're going to look at what the life of Christ looks like when we run with endurance towards the goal. So Philippians chapter 3, starting in verse 12, says this. Not that I have already obtained this or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind, And straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call in Christ Jesus. Let those of us who are mature think this way, and if anything you think otherwise, God will reveal that also to you. Only let us hold true to what we have attained. Let's pray. God, we just come to you right now and we ask for open hearts. We ask, Father, that you would teach us what you want to teach us, that we would have ears to hear. Father, we just ask that you would move in this place, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right, now, in context, this particular passage that we're looking at today is in response to Paul right before this, basically just pouring out his heart to the church in Philippi. And he's saying that the number one ambition of his life and the purpose of his existence is to know Christ to the fullest extent. Wow. Church, there is truly no greater aspiration in this life than to fully know Jesus, to fully know his power, and to experience perfect fellowship with him. That's the goal. That's the reason that we run the race, to know Christ more intimately than our mortal minds can even comprehend. And that, my friends, is Paul's aim to know Jesus, and to be more like him in every aspect of his life. So he says in verse 12, with the goal of knowing Christ in mind, he says, not that I have already obtained this, the full knowledge of Christ, or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. So basically, Paul is saying, listen, guys, I'm far from perfect. I have not yet arrived. I have not reached spiritual maturity. Have you ever met somebody who thinks they've arrived? I mean, I'm not going to lie. I struggle with those kind of people a little bit, you know. It's kind of like, all right, bro, your armpits sweat just like the rest of us, right? So, you know, you're not, you're not above anybody, right? One, none of us will ever arrive this side of heaven. We're not perfect. Even the most spiritual people in your life are flawed to the core because they're sinners. Spiritual maturity takes a lifetime. Simply put, none of us will ever arrive until that day when we arrive, right? We will never reach the depths of our God until we are made complete in heaven. The mysteries of God, they're they're endless, guys. There is always more to discover. The more you realize how much you don't know when you start discovering more about him. 
It keeps you coming back. It keeps you searching. It keeps your eyes on the prize. Now, Paul is is setting a great example here for us, I believe, because he's showing us that you can often tell how spiritually mature someone is by their humility. The Bible says that God opposes the proud and gives grace to the humble. One of the most vital elements of running the spiritual race is to run with humility. Pride and arrogance will always prove to be a stumbling block in your progress, always. It doesn't matter if you've been a Christian for two years, if you've been a Christian for 50 years, you have not arrived. There is more for you to learn and there is more to discover about who God is. So learn from Paul's example here. Keep running the race, but run with humility. So he says, I have not obtained what I'm aiming for, but I press on to make it my own because Christ made me his own. Now, this term, I press on, really has an almost violent connotation to it. Uh, it, it's, It's more like the idea of vigorously running a race until you seize it. So he's saying that he is using every ounce of his energy to achieve what God has placed in front of him. This is not a casual jog. This is... This is a rigorous marathon, and he's not, he's, he's not letting anything get in the way of reaching the goal that was set before him. He is all in. So what about you? Are you in? Because if you are, Paul is about to reveal his strategy for running the race with endurance. He says this in verse 13. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own. So once again, I have not arrived, but one thing I do forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. One thing I do. I think it's worth noting here that he doesn't say one thing I know. He says one thing I do. This implies action. It implies putting something into practice, right? It goes beyond knowing, beyond knowledge. It has to be lived out. Let's be honest. I could do all the research on the planet. I could learn everything there is to know about running a race. But it doesn't make me a runner until my feet hit the track, right? It does me no good if I don't put it into practice. It's simply knowledge... And the hard question is, have you truly learned something if it's not put into practice? I would say no. You you might know about it, right? You might be educated about it. But until you do it, it's just a learned theory. We are not runners until we start running. James says it this way. He says, but be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror. For he looks at himself and goes away and at once forgets what he looks like. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. We are called to be doers of the word, not just hearers. And I know this is going to sound kind of harsh to some of us, but I feel like I'm supposed to say, if your Bible knowledge is not overflowing into the way that you live your life, if you are not doing the simple things that your Bible knowledge tells you, then it might be time to ask yourself, do I truly know and believe this, or is it just academic knowledge to me? We've got to be doers. We need to put things into practice. It's time to get off the sidelines, start running, and running requires action. In fact, I think it's interesting that one of our core values here at 14.6 is doing. We connect, do, and grow. We want to be a church who puts our knowledge into action and do what we are called to do as the body of Christ. We want to start doing things for the kingdom of God. 
And there's lots of ways that we can start doing. Just fill out a connect card. We'll put you to work. Even though Paul says he does one thing, that one thing he's talking about is threefold because there are three elements to this one thing. The first one is this, that we've got to let go of the past. Let go of the past. You can't run a race if you're looking backwards. You have to learn to leave the past in the past. Too often, we get all tripped up because we want to live in the comforts of the past, don't we? Or the regrets of the past. Sometimes we hold on to offenses and hurts from the past, pain from the past. We, we like to hold on to our achievements and accomplishments also, don't we? Or here's a really big one for, for myself and for a lot of church people. We, we cling to the experiences of the past. We're all guilty of this. But the truth is, if you are more enamored by the things that were than what is yet to come, you will eventually come to a standstill in your spiritual growth. You can't effectively move forward when you're looking behind you. Paul says, one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind. Letting go of the past. That's hard to do, isn't it? I know, I know it is for me. I'm a very sentimental and melancholy type of person. Uh, not so much with stuff. In fact, when it comes to stuff, I could care less. Drives my wife nuts. If, if I have no use for it, I just throw it out. Mail, whatever it is, I just throw it away. And then she's all like, that was a really important thing. So when it comes to, a, to possessions, I have really no attachments. But when it comes to memories, now that's a different story. When it comes to experiences and relationships from my past, I can get stuck romanticizing in that all day long. And why would I want to forget about them? Well, this forgetting that Paul is talking about here, it's a special kind of forgetting. It's, it's not so much about wiping things from our memories, forgetting the good things that we've been through. Because all throughout his letters, Paul, he mentions people by name from the past. He mentions cities and places and events that took place. So Paul is not saying that we should forget that, that we've been through things. That's not it. But we should not let those things hinder us from moving forward. He forgets them in a way that he will not lose focus of the race that he is running. For instance, I can still remember the color of my wife's shirt and lipstick from our first date about 20 years ago. I, I don't know why, random random. She looked good, okay? That's all I'm going to say. But I remember all of those things because there's an emotional connection to that memory, right? And there's, there's nothing wrong with that. But, but what if I only wanted to see her wear that shirt and that lipstick today? What if I refuse to notice that she looks good in other clothing and lipstick as well? Then there would be a problem, wouldn't there? Right? How can we move forward in our relationship as a married couple if I'm still looking back and longing for what once was? Yes, I remember it. I don't want to go back to it because, in all honesty, it's only gotten better. It's only gotten better. And I think that many of us do this in our spiritual lives. We are so attached to the times that meant something to us that we refuse to enjoy the new blessings that God is pouring out because it's not what once was. How can our relationship with Christ mature and move forward if we prefer to keep the relationship exactly how it was when we first met him? It doesn't work. We have to let go of the past, no matter what it is. I mean, if, if we think about Paul, he had some amazing accomplishments under his belt. He was one of the greatest church planters of all time, and God used him for amazing things to advance the gospel. But even so, Paul refused to let his past hinder him from running the race. He said, whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. When we live on the legacy of the past, we become complacent and we begin to lose that sense of wonder for what God is going to do next. I don't know about you, but I don't want to lose that. 
I don't want to be like Uncle Rico from Napoleon Dynamite, right? If you've ever seen it, he's just a middle-aged dude who's still stuck in the days that he was a uh, high school football player, right? We don't want to live in the glory days like that. It's like, bro, you need to move on. Those days are gone, right? Live in today. The Bible says, say not, why were the former days better than these? For it is not from wisdom that you ask this. <laughs> if we want to run the race, we can't keep living in the good old days. We need to renew our minds to see that God is doing a new and better thing. He's in the business of making all things new. Now, Paul had achievements but he also had past accomplishments that he wasn't so proud of. He had regrets, didn't he? Before Christ, he was a Christian killer. He would arrest Christians and put them in prison, sometimes kill them. That's some heavy stuff to carry around. And if he wanted to, he could have easily allowed the regret and shame from his past break his concentration, but he refused to focus on his failures. Why? Because he knew that there was now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. He says, I'm going to run. So what about you? Are you letting the shame and regret in your life keep you from running? Are you letting it hold you in the past, keep you on the sidelines of the race? Are your past failures bringing you to a standstill? Then you need to look to Jesus. Get back in the race. Stop condemning yourself because all that junk that you are holding on to was paid for and forgiven at the cross and there is now no condemnation for you in Christ Jesus. So start running. Let it go. Let me hear you say, I'm ready to run. I'm ready to run. Jesus said, no one who puts his hands to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. It doesn't matter if it's good or bad. If it is stealing your focus from running the race, then you better count it as loss and forget about it. It's a hindrance. Are you willing to follow Paul's example and leave behind the things that might make you complacent? Are you in? Because if you are, then the next thing you gotta do is you gotta look to the future. You gotta look to the future. Focus on what is yet to come. Once the past no longer has a hold on you, you will be able to, to look forward with wonder and expectation for what the future holds. To run a race, you have to focus on what is ahead. You have to be attentive. And isn't that exactly what Jesus told us to do anyway? We, we wait for the blessed hope of his return, don't we? We look forward and, and anticipate our heavenly home. So it's about being eternally minded, but it's also about living in wonder of what God can do this side of heaven. See, if, if you're still breathing, God is not done with you. Your race is not finished, and I promise you that it is never too late to start running if you focus on the idea of, I wonder what God is going to do next, I guarantee that you will start running with a greater sense of purpose and a greater desire to know Christ. Church, we've got to look to the future. He says it this way. He says, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind, and here it is, straining forward to what lies ahead. He says, I'm not going to settle for what was because I know that my God is still moving. And I refuse to live in the comforts of my past because I know that the best is yet to come. Do you believe that the best is yet to come? Yeah. I do. Amen. Looking to the future, it takes dedication. It takes intentionality because the truth is, whenever you start making progress, it's inevitable that you will come up against some kind of opposition, some sort of thing that will hold you back. 
and it's going to steal your focus from what lies ahead. I remember a while back, I was working really, really hard to get healthy, and I was doing a lot of running. And I know by the looks of me, you would think I don't even know what that word means. But (laughs) I was actually doing quite a bit of running. I was making a lot of progress, and I was feeling really, really good. And uh, all of a sudden, it just seemed like out of nowhere, my shins started hurting me really bad. And uh, I kept pushing through it. And I'm like, it's just, you know, no pain, no gain. You got to keep going. So I just keep running and keep running. And eventually it just got to the point where I had to take days off in between running because I had to let my legs heal up so that I could do it again. And it was, it was very, very discouraging. It felt like it derailed my progress. Right? I couldn't even finish my normal routines when running. This felt like, wow, what's the point of trying anymore? And I was talking with my brother-in-law and just kind of sharing with him, you know, what, what was happening. And I remember he, he looks at me and he's like, maybe it's the way you're running. He's like, have you ever tried running on your toes? I'm like, no. But I'd never done it. So I went home and started a new technique. And I started running on my toes. And I couldn't believe the difference. To this day, I run on my toes when I run. And I have no issues. And I share that story with you because just like my progress in running, sometimes our faith, it gets a little derailed, doesn't it? Maybe you've been a Christian for a long time, but you're, you're in a place where it just it, it feels stale. We've all been there. You feel indifferent. You feel stuck. And you don't know why or how you get to where you are, but you know that you've been sitting on the sidelines, and every time you try to get back in the race, you encounter another setback. May I suggest that you may need to change your technique and run a little differently. Maybe it's time to ask yourself, what am I not doing in my spiritual life that I know could help me grow and mature? Am I, am I caring for the orphans and the widows? Am I giving my time to serve the needs of my church? Where in the process, I'm going to have fellowship with other believers. Am I involved in a a connect group? That's how you find fellowship. Am I I tithing the way God asked me to tithe? Am I discipling someone or am I being discipled? The Bible gives us a lot of practical things to do as believers. And the truth is, these are not really requests. These are signs of spiritual maturity, church. Church. But many of us never give them a second thought. Or we just make excuses when we do. And we keep doing what we've been doing and wondering, why are we becoming spiritually complacent in our lives? It's time to do something different. Change your technique. We have to break the attitude of complacency. We have to let him show us that there is still things ahead. Look at this church. It's no secret that God is doing some amazing things here at 14.6. We can all see it. We're seeing people come to Christ. We're seeing people get baptized. We're growing. And it's important that we look forward and plan for the future. Because the truth is, we don't know what the future holds. But we do want to be open to and prepared for whatever move of God is going to happen here. We want to be a catalyst for what God's doing, not a hindrance, right? As Pastor Pat always says, God will work through you or he'll work around you, but he's going to work. I know that, that change can be difficult for all of us, but God is in the business of making all things new. And I truly believe that God's doing something new here at 14.6 that's going to blow us all away. And we all have the choice to either be resistant to it or Focus on what lies ahead and run the race with intentionality. And I pray that we all choose the latter. Now, in pursuit of fully knowing Christ, Paul says, I let go of the past. I look to the future. And then he says this, and personally, I think this is really where the rubber meets the road. This is the most important part. He says, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. For Paul, he knew that in order to fully know Christ, he had to fully give himself to the race. And he had to do it in the here and now. 
This isn't back to the future where we can just jump into the DeLorean, right, and go back in time or go forward or whatever, right? Now, we can learn from the past, and we can plan for the future, but the only way to truly make progress is to seize this very moment and start running. Are you in? Are you ready to run? Are you ready to make progress today? Because if you are, then we need to embrace the present. Seize the moment. Where you are right now, seize it. What God is doing in your life right now, embrace it. What God is teaching you in this moment, embrace it. None of us are guaranteed tomorrow, church. None of us. So let's live today with intentionality. In the here and now. Let's live like tomorrow may never come. Jesus could come back. It may not. There's no time like the present, and we've got to embrace it, my friends. Could you imagine what could happen in this city or in the surrounding areas if every one of us in this room said, we're going to do what Paul says. We're going to let go of the past. We're going to look to the future, and we're going to seize. We are going to embrace the present. I truly believe that we would see things that we would never thought we would have ever seen. God would move like crazy because when you put things into action, God moves. Now, after saying all of this about how to run the race, Paul says this in 15. He says, let those of us who are mature think this way. And if in anything you think otherwise... God will reveal that also to you. Only let us hold true to what we have attained. Let those of us who are mature think this way. In other words, this mindset of letting go of the past, looking to the future, and embracing the present, it's a sign of spiritual maturity. Paul's saying that spiritually mature people don't think that they have arrived and forgetting what lies behind, they pour their energies into the pursuit of the full knowledge of Jesus Christ. The spiritually mature run the race rather than imagine that it's over. And I wonder today, are you in? Are you willing to take on this mindset? Are you willing to let go of what is comfortable and familiar in order to make a greater impact on your faith and in the kingdom of God? Are you in? Because if you're not, Paul makes it clear here to the people in Philippi that if you're struggling with adopting this mindset, that God would reveal it to them at some point. This is the truth. God will show it to you at some point. Maybe right now, this very moment, some of you, God is revealing that to you in this moment. Maybe he's telling you it's time to adjust a few things in your life. Maybe he's telling you to seize the moment and start running. Because the truth is, this race is happening as we speak. And we all run at different paces, don't we? Some run faster and harder than others do. We all run in different terrain. Our lives, we experience different setbacks and advantages. And those things affect the way that we run. And we even run different lengths because some of us started running the race sooner or later than others, didn't we? But here's the thing. Regardless of our differences, we are all running the same race. And none of us will reach the finish line until this life is completed. Or until Jesus comes back, right? Either way, we know that at the end, we will all receive the same prize, the full and complete gaining of Christ, the resurrection and ultimate perfection. Wow. That's worth running for. It all comes down to what we do with Jesus, church. Paul's last comment says, let us hold true to what we have attained. 
In other words, regardless of your progress, regardless of your maturity, the main thing is that we hold true to the saving grace of Jesus Christ that he gave to us through his blood, that we always unite and stand in Christ Jesus and in his death and resurrection. We can have differences over who's spiritually mature or not, if we want to, but none of that matters in the light of what Jesus did on that cross. That is why we run the race. The Bible says in Hebrews, therefore, since we, have, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Jesus is the focus. Jesus is the prize. He is the reason that we run. And he is the one who's waiting at the end, my friends. So let's lay aside every weight and sin that so easily tangles us up. And let's run with endurance the race that is set before us. Let's look to Jesus. Let's press on. Let's keep the goal in mind. So are you in today? Yes. Are you willing to let go of the past? Are you willing to look to the future and embrace the present in order to reach the goal at the finish line? Are you in? I sure hope that you are. And it's my prayer that after today, every single one of us in this room, we become spiritual athletes expert runners who strive to mature in our relationship with our Savior who gave everything for us. Runners who vigorously pursue the fullness of Christ. So let me ask you one last time. Are you in? Are you in? If you are, then it's time to are you in. It's time to run. Let's pray. Jesus, we thank you that you have chosen us, that you loved us so much that you you came and died on a cross for us. Jesus, I pray that our one aim, our one goal would be to fully know you, to fully love you, to fully experience you. Jesus, if there's anyone in this room that doesn't know you, God, I pray that you would draw them and that they would make that decision to follow you today, to make you Lord of their life. And for those of us who've known you for a long time, I pray that we would be willing to make changes in our life, to change our mindset to where we see that you are moving, your word is alive, it is active. And that as we live it out, things change, things happen. Father, we just thank you so much for all that you've done for us and all that you continue to do. As we go home, we pray that you would just bless each and every one here and their families. We love you in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you guys. We love you guys. And uh, we'll see you next week.